Stand by for crime. Hi, Chuck Morgan, KOP newscaster, Los Angeles. The story I'd like to tell you about today really began back in 1919. It's quite a while ago as far as I'm concerned. In fact, I wasn't even around at the time. Therefore, I was completely in the dark when the telephone call came from my blonde secretary, Carol Curtis. Carol had been away on a short vacation. I was due in at International Airport last Monday morning when I was to meet her. The phone was ringing when I reached my office. All right, all right. I don't know why Pappy couldn't have given me another secretary like Glamourpus was away. Hello, Morgan speaking. Hello, Chucky boy. Glamourpus, where are you? I'm at the airport. I caught an earlier plane. But listen, I've got... Save it till I get there, Glamourpus. Go in and buy yourself a cup of coffee and I'll be right along. No, Chuck, don't bother. I'm taking the next plane for Seattle. You what? In Seattle, I'm catching a plane for Vancouver. Now, look... Wait a minute. What's this all about? Well, if you'll stop interrupting, I'll tell you. I only have a minute before the plane leaves. You're not taking any plane, but go ahead and talk. Well, somehow my suitcase got it mixed up with another passenger. Yeah? After we landed, I went into the ladies' room, and when I opened the case, it was full of money. It was what? Thousands and thousands of dollars. Oh. And it was also a map, or half a map, something about the Quentin McLean fortune. So I'm going up to Vancouver to collect the other half of the map. Are you nuts, or you're just trying to be funny? Now, you and get sorry, back Chucky here... Sorry, Chucky boy, I've got to catch that plane. Call me at the Vancouver Hotel. Bye. Glamorous, I'm going... Hello, hello. Uh, oh, the dumb-headed blondes. I... Oh, hello, Patty, come in. Well, what's the matter with you? Plenty. That was Carol on the phone. She's lost her mind. No kidding. What hospital are you committing her to? Now, look, this isn't funny. She called from the airport and said she was taking a plane to Vancouver because she found a bag full of money and half a map. Does that make sense to you? Nothing much that either of you two do makes sense to me when you start one of your wild adventures. Oh, can it? What kind of a map did she find? I don't know. She said something about the Quentin McLean fortune. Quentin McLean? Yeah. You ever hear the name? Sure I have. So has everybody else. Well, I haven't. Then you don't read your history book. Quentin McLean made a couple of zillion dollars out of some railroads he owned. Back in 1919, he spent one of those zillion on booze. On what? Booze, liquor, whiskey, rum, anything alcoholic. Don't look so stupid. Prohibition was on the way. Quint read the handwriting on the wall and quietly went around buying all the liquor he could lay his hands on. Well, he's a smart operator. Oh, yeah, except for one thing. His wife, Bertha McLean, was one of the country's leading temperance workers. Oh, no. As a matter of fact, she practically put the prohibition deal over single-handed. So Quint, the sly dog, didn't tell her what he was doing. He bought himself a large yacht, about half as big as the Titanic, I'd say. Named her the Bertha M and loaded his liquids on board. <laughs> Sailed away for a big drunk, huh? Big drunk, my foot. He had about $3 million worth of liquor on that tub. Yeah? He planned to anchor the thing 12 miles out and sell it retail. The only trouble was he died of a heart attack the day after Prohibition became effective. And what happened to the liquor? What do you think? When his wife found out what was aboard the Bertha M, she sailed her off one dark night and sank her. Oh, no. Oh, I'm a son of a gun. Pappy, that map. You don't think the Carol really... Well, if she has, Chucky boy, you better marry her quick because she's worth around three million bucks. Oh, what a story, Pappy. It'll be sensational. The hottest thing that hit the wires in years. Hey, where do you think you're going? If you need me for anything, Pappy, call me at the Vancouver Hotel in British Columbia. <laughs> caught the next plane for Seattle and settled down to do some heavy thinking. And the more I began to analyze this nutty caper, the more it seemed like an adventure yarn from the pen of Robert Louis Stevenson. Still, there was the money and the map and Pappy's story about the Quentin McLean booze ship. Then the usual questions began to present themselves. Carol had picked up a wrong bag, found it full of money, and instead of turning it over to the police, she caught another plane out of the country like an escaping criminal. On the other hand, I checked at the airport and found that no report had been made of a stolen suitcase full of banknotes. Now, why? Well, I wasn't any nearer the answer when we landed at Seattle, and I picked up a plane for Vancouver. I was even farther away from the answer when we sighted the peaks of the lions and then began to ease down toward the airport of the lovely city of Vancouver, British Columbia. You know, I half expected to find Glamourpus waiting for me at the loading gate, but of course she wasn't. Someone else was, though. A very beautiful girl in a light blue linen suit and a rakish beret. She 
She picked me out of the crowd as though she'd known me for years and stuck out her hand. Hello. You're Chuck Morgan, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. I'm sure I've never met you before. I couldn't forget that beautiful smile. <laughs> Carol said you'd probably make a remark like that. I'm Candace Campbell. Carol? Carol Curtis? Yes, that's right. We got acquainted coming up on the plane. She's staying with me in my apartment. Oh, I see. Well, uh, uh, how does she know I was coming, and why isn't she here to meet me? She said she knew you were coming because she said she knew you. Oh. And the reason she isn't here to meet you is because she'd some urgent business to attend to. And the reason she asked me to meet you is because she knew you'd look for her at the Vancouver Hotel. They're filled up there. So I, I guess you'd better come home with me. I've plenty of room. <laughs> it seems to clear things up. Did uh, Carol say where she was going on her urgent business? No, but she did ask me where Point Sutton was located. But I'm sure that wasn't where she went. Oh, why not? Oh, because there's nothing there. Just a point of land in the wilderness jutting out into the ocean. Oh, Fifa does strange things to people. I beg your pardon? Hmm? Oh, nothing, nothing. Uh, by the way, there must be another hotel in town where a bachelor could... Oh, I'm sorry, there isn't. Every hotel is filled to capacity. There's a lumberman's convention this week. Oh, I didn't know. I'm afraid you'll just have to accept my invitation. <laughs> in that case, I'll be delighted to. Thank you very much. Shall we go? Well, for my money, there wasn't much about this that added up. When I mentally figured up the score, the answer came out on the wrong side of the ledger. Number one, Glamour Puss, even though the lust for gold had driven her stark raving mad, never would have sent a girl as beautiful as this Candace Campbell to meet me alone. <laughs> never. And number two, Miss Campbell was unusually anxious to have me accompany her to her apartment. Why? And I kept thinking about the situation as I was checked through customs and we headed for the taxi stand. And at last, my thinking paid off with an idea. Something wrong? No, no, I, I, I think I'd better check with my boss in L.A. and let him know I'm not at the bottom of Puget Sound or something. <laughs> Would you be kind enough to keep your eye on the carpet bag? Of course, just hurry back. So I found a phone booth and called the Vancouver Hotel. Asked them if they had any vacancies. They said, sure, all I wanted. So I said, how about the Lumberman's Convention? They said that wasn't until next week. So that was that. The beautiful Candace was a cockeyed liar. But what was her game? And what had happened to Glamour Puss? And how was I going to find out unless I went with Candace to her apartment? Well, that answer was obvious. I'd have to go to the apartment and take whatever came along. So I did. The beautiful Candace drove us there in her own car. She lived on Camby Street. I hope Carol's back. She's really going to be surprised. I hope you mean she'll be surprised at the same thing I do. Well, here we are. Carol? Carol, Chuck's here. Oh, that's too bad. I guess she hasn't got back. Well, sit down, Chuck. Make yourself at home. Oh, sure, can you thanks. Can I fix your drink? Well, that sounds like a good idea. Fine. I'll only be a minute. Well, so far, everything seemed normal. Too normal. I looked around and decided that the beautiful Candace must be in the chips. This bailiwick she was maintaining must cost at least a couple hundred bucks a month which for a 20-year-old working girl was a tidy sum. But who said she was a working girl? Did working girls drive around to $5,000 automobiles? So I began pondering on what kind of work a working girl would work at who lived in such luxury. Just then, the door to the bedroom opened and a man stepped out. The man was holding a gun. His face was familiar. I'd know that ugly puss anywhere. It was Pickles Beckner, the New York Underworld's most recent contribution to the gutter. Hello, Morgan. Fancy meeting you here. Yeah, fancy. How many jumps ahead of the FBI were you when you made it across the border, Pickles? I'm clean, Morgan. Clean as a whistle, so skip the cracks and hand over the map. What map are you talking about? Look, Morgan, let's not kid around. Okay. I happen to know you got the map, and I'm going to take it away from you. Well, me. that's a good trick if you can do it. Just what makes you so sure I have the map? I don't know why I'm so patient with you, chum. One of my boys was outside the phone booth when your gal Friday called you back at the airport in L.A. He seen her address an envelope and drop it in the mailbox. The map was inside. Well, then it's still inside. I never got it. You know better than to lie to me like that, Morgan. I got ways of making guys like you sound off. 
You want to should demonstrate a couple? Now, look, use your head, Beckner. If Carol mailed me the map from International Airport, would I get it in Hollywood before 3 o'clock the same day? If she sent it special delivery, you would. Oh, nuts. And if you didn't get it, you wouldn't be up here now, so hand it over. You know, it's too bad you're not allergic to wishful thinking, Pickles. Because right now, you're wishing for something that isn't in the books. Yeah? What's allergic mean? It means that unless you do some fast thinking, the man who just came out of the bedroom behind you is going to suck you behind the ear with a blackjack he's holding. Yeah? Morgan, you took the words right out of my mouth. On account of it's behind you, a guy is standing with a blackjack, and the minute I give him the nod, you're going to get it. Well, one of us was lying like a rug. There wasn't any doubt in my mind which one. Me. No one was standing behind Pickles. But someone was standing behind me. A minute later, he proved it. Pickles gave him the nod, and... Fuck! I got it, the way Pickles promised. I went out like a snuffed candle. The familiar pinwheels, shooting stars, and zooming comets put on an excellent display, and then vanished, and soft darkness closed in. The darkness gave away gradually to grayness, and then to bright light. I went into the bedroom, and found nothing but destruction... Apparently, Pickles had been positive that the map was hidden around the premises. Then I saw something he overlooked, or rather neglected. A suitcase, lying on its side with the gold initial CC stamped on the letter. CC for Carol Curtis. I walked over and picked it up. It was locked. But there was something inside, something that rustled when I shook it. Money, banknotes, the thousands and thousands of dollars that Carol had told me about over the phone. So then I knew that Glamagus had actually been here and had probably been kidnapped or worse. Now, the conclusion of Stand By for Crime. Well, having figured this all out didn't help matters any. The beautiful Candace's $5,000 car was parked at the curb and the keys were in it. So I got in and headed for the nearest filling station and asked directions to Point Sutton. I drove north along Marine Drive. And after a while, all signs of habitation disappeared and I was on a deserted road with trees thick on both sides and forming a tunnel for my lights up ahead. Then suddenly, I eased up on the accelerator and swung to the side of the road. A figure was lying there, a girl, who lifted up her head when I stopped and began sobbing hysterically. <laughs> Chuck, Chuck, please help me. Candace, sure, sure, I'll help you. What happened? They beat me. They, they kept slapping me. They told me they'd kill me unless I told. It was awful. I thought they were going no, to No, wait a minute, wait a minute. Take it easy, take it easy. You're all right. Who was it who beat you? Why? Men who were in the apartment. Pickles? Then you're... I, I mean, you didn't... At first, there was only one. The one called Pickles. Yeah? He kept calling me Carol Curtis. He wanted to know where the map was and the money. I, I told him I didn't know and he hit wait me. Wait a minute. And... When did all this happen? Where? Right here. After that other man in the apartment hit you. Pickles made me come with him in his car. Huh? He parked right here and told me that unless I, I told him where the map was, he'd kill me. He began slapping my face and getting madder and madder when I told him I didn't know about the map. Well, I'll be darned. And he thought you were glam... I, I mean, my secretary, Carol Curtis. Yes. Huh? Then another car came along. The other man was in it. He said he'd searched the apartment but couldn't find the map. So they left you here and started for Point Sutton. Yes. Chuck and Carol's at yeah, Point Sutton. Yeah, there's no time to lose. Look, Candace, I can't take you back to Vancouver now, but I'll drop you at the first house we come to and you... There aren't any houses between here and Point Sutton. And I don't want to be dropped anyway. I want to go with you. Okay, if that's the way you want it, let's go. Candace's $5,000 car really lived up to its reputation during the next few minutes. It wasn't long before I saw the turnoff and swung the wheel hard. The road was filled with twists and turns. How far is it to the end of the point? And what will we find when we get there? It's only a little way. There are a couple of fishing shacks and nothing else. Then we better park this handsome crate and make it on foot. There's no sense in warning pickles if we can help it. So we parked the car, turned out the lights, and started to head on foot. There was a bright moon. And far off to the right, we could hear breakers exploding on the rocky shore. After a while, we came to the first of the fishing shacks, but it was dark and deserted, so we kept on without stopping. Five minutes later, a light winked at us through the trees. It was the second shack, and it was occupied. As we got close, the sound of surf grew louder, loud enough to cover sound of our approach. 
We reached the shack and peered cautiously inside. The first thing I saw was Glamorous. She was tied tightly to a chair, staring toward the back end of the shack. And by the expression in her eyes, I gathered she wasn't too happy about her predicament. Jack, it's Carol. Yeah, yeah, so I see. Careful, here comes Pickles. Pickles and another man came into range of vision. They stood in front of Glamorous with their backs to us, which was a lucky break. Pickles had a short length of rope in his hand with a knot on one end. All right, baby. One more chance. Where's the map? I've already told you. I haven't got it. You... Where's the map? I told you. I mailed the check Morgan. It wouldn't do you any good anyhow. Those men... Look, chicken, if you expect me to believe that story about two men pulling a pass from by selling Pickles Beckner a phony map that they drew themselves, you're crazy. Pickles Beckner ain't that dumb. But it's true. They were here in this shack when I arrived this afternoon. I heard them talking about how they tricked you into believing an old sea captain had told them where the Birth M was sunk. And they made a map. You're a liar. Where are these men now? A third man arrived and told them that something had gone wrong. The money and map had been stolen. All three had been left in a boat. I still say you're lying. No one pulls a job like that on Pickles Beckner. No one. If you ask me, you're a natural for a job like that. You're so used to pulling jobs like that on other people that you're... Shut up! Oh! Chuck, this is awful. Yeah, come away from the window where we can talk. This will do it. Chuck, isn't there something we can do? Have you got a gun? No. Our only chance is to get Pickles and his boyfriend outside. Oh. Now look, get back to the car as fast as you can. Drive it up here with the lights on and the engine roaring. But if we warn them that... Never mind about that. I'll take care of everything. All right. So Candace went back for the car. And I hunted around until I found a nice, fat club. Hard enough to make an impression on the skull, even as thick as the one worn by Pickles Beckner. I waited until I heard the sound of Candace's car way down the road. Then I moved up to the shack's door, and I got there just as Pickles yelled. Listen, there's a car coming. Thank you. Baby, one peep out of you, and I'll blow your brains out. Mike does the light. Okay, I'll get outside and bring whoever that is inside. And don't let him give you no arguments. So after a minute, the door of the shack opened and closed. A dim figure slunk out. I followed them until we were far enough away so we couldn't be heard. Then I stepped up quickly and tried the club out for size. It worked fine. Mike dropped like Isaac Newton's apple and lay still. I took off his belt, strapped his hands and legs together, stuffed a handkerchief into his mouth, and then found his gun. Well, now Pickles and I were even. No, I had the advantage. Candace and her $5,000 car were on my side. She was roaring down the road and at a pace that threatened destruction. I sneaked back to the shack and waited. The $5,000 job swung around a curve, and the headlights brought the shack into sharp relief. Candace, smart girl, brought the car to a stop within three feet of the shack's door and left the lights on. For a minute, nothing happened. Then the cabin door opened and Pickle stood there, a perfect target. Hey, Mike! How is it? All right, Pickles, you haven't got a chance. Get your hands up. Morgan, you dirty... Much as I disliked shooting a man without first warning him, I wished right then and there that I'd forgotten my principles for once and let him have it. All right, Morgan, I still got your girl. Throw down your gun and come in with your hands up. Don't do it, Chuck. He'll shoot you if you do. Shut up. Oh. oh. Hear that, Morgan? There's more coming every second you take to make up your mind. Oh. Make your decision, Morgan. I ain't kidding. No. He wasn't kidding. I knew Pickles. I listened to Carol taking two more blows and then started to throw my gun away and head for the door. Don't do it, Chuck. Wait. Candace was back in the car away from the shack. I didn't get it until she stopped and rammed the gears into low and started forward. Then I saw what she was up to. I ran around to the shack's window just as the $5,000 job crashed through the front of the shack as over a paper. One headlight went out, but the other held so me Pickles crouched in the corner, his eyes wide and scared. Pickles, this time you get no warning. Oh, don't shoot again, Morgan. I'm hit. Don't shoot again. Take that gun out of the way and stand up. Facing the wall with your hands behind your head. Nobody outsmarts Pickles Beckner. Nobody. You cheap, dumb parasite. You've been outsmarted by one 20-year-old girl. Pickles Beckner and his pal made a couple of fine prisoners. The Vancouver police were glad to get them. Well, we drove back to Candace's apartment and went up for a drink. This time, when the beautiful Candace disappeared into the kitchen, 
I was reasonably sure she'd reappear carrying a tray of glasses. Hey, this is quite a joint your girlfriend sports. Hmm? My girlfriend? Mm -hmm. What are you doing, fishing for compliments again? What do you mean, acting as though you'd never seen this place before? You've been living here, haven't you? Living here? Are you kidding? I'm living at the Vancouver Hotel. Vancouver? Do you mean you've never been in this room before? Of course I mean it. Well, I'll be a lot... I hope I wasn't too long. Here you are. Carol? Chuck? Thanks. Listen, Candace, there's still an awful lot about this that uh, needs clearing up. For example, you told me... Oh, yes, I know. I told a bunch of whoppers, and I want you to know why. So do we. Go ahead, Candace. Well, in the first place, I'm Quentin McLean's granddaughter. What? You mean the man who bought the booze and stashed it on his yacht? Maybe that's right. Grandfather and grandmother used to spend their summers right up near here. And that's how my mother happened to meet my father and why I was born here. Well, what do you know? Well, how did you know about the map and the money and all the rest? Well, I was visiting some friends in New York, and one night at a nightclub, I heard Grandfather McLean's name mentioned. Yeah. So I eavesdropped and heard enough to make me think that the sunken ship had actually been discovered. And I naturally felt that its cargo belonged to my mother, since there were no other heirs. Uh-huh. So I started home, and on the plane from Los Angeles to Vancouver, I was Carol's seatmate. And we naturally got to talking. She told me all about you, Chuck. As a matter Stop of fact... right there, little girl. This big gorilla hears too much of that. <laughs> all right. Well, anyway, when Carol learned I lived in Vancouver, she began asking me all sorts of questions, especially about Point Sutton. Ah, so that made you think that Carol had something to do with the sunken yard. That's right. So then, when she told me you'd be up on the next plane... Now, wait a minute. Glamourpus, how did you know I'd be up on the next plane? Simply because I know you, Chucky boy. Oh. You big hunk of stuff, you. <laughs> I see. Uh, go ahead, Candace. Well, then I thought it'd be a good idea to find out what you knew, Chuck. And I knew I could do that by winning your confidence. And I knew I could win your confidence if I told you Carol was my guest. <laughs> well, now, wait, you didn't have to go that far, Candy. You Candy? Could... Hmm? Look. Let's finish up the explanations and get out of here, Chucky boy. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, let's see. Pickles must have come up to Vancouver ahead of his pals. There were two of them on the plane that Carol took out of New York, a man and a woman. Why a woman? Because the money was in a female suitcase, remember? A female whose initials were CC. That would be Pickles' old girlfriend, Catherine Kramer. And when Carol got the wrong suitcase by mistake, neither Kathy nor her companion could report it to the police because they probably figured that any money the Pickles could raise would be stolen. So they called Pickles in Vancouver and told him that Carol was arriving on the afternoon flight. Now, Carol arrived on an earlier flight. But I was on the second flight and left the airport with Candace. So Pickles naturally thought that Candace was Carol. But what I can't figure out is why Catherine Kramer and her boyfriend didn't try to get the suitcase away from Carol in L.A. Ah, the answer to that one is easy. What do you mean easy? Well, as soon as I found the money and the map in the suitcase, I made a copy of the map... Mailed it to you and turned the money over to the airport authorities. You what? No, wait a minute. Glamour puss. That suitcase with the money in it is locked up right now in the trunk compartment of Candace's car. I found it in that bedroom. The initial CC were on it was yours. I heard the money rustle. Rustle? Well, there's a switch. I think I can clear up that little mystery. The rustling wasn't caused by money, Chuck. Huh? There are things that a woman wears that rustle too. Ah. <laughs> and you seem to forget that my initials are also CC. See, oh, oh, no. Do you, do you mean that all this time I... Oh, no. Chucky boy, this is where we came in. There's a plane back to L.A. in an hour. Shall we take it? Glamopus, for once I'm sure I've got the right answer. Yes, let's take the plane. <laughs> 